I got the honor of the last presentation of the WLPC. I don't know why, but there it is. And it's about fast roaming. That's me. Our roaming, the change from one AP to the other can take some time, depending on the connection method that we use. We have a couple of methods to speed it up, and the best one is, of course, fast BSS transition, based on 11R. And if you use that, the standard defines the process of roaming as minimizing the amount of time that we lose the connection to our distribution system. And that is likely a good idea. This technology is from 2008. So why do I bother you with 17-year-old technology? Well, Dubia said we have to also teach the fundamentals. Peter says, know your basics. And too often it's not enabled. And the Wi-Fi checklist says it's recommended. If you want to see some other perspectives of this, last year was a talk from Hans. You might want it to watch it. But for this presentation, and especially for the last minute, I assume that Wi-Fi drivers don't have bugs and clients never misbehave. Your mileage may worry. And everything in this presentation is based on captures and the 2020 standard. Before our client roams, it has to decide to roam. We have some technologies to improve that. Very important, but not part of this talk. And if we are using open networks, PSK-based networks, it's already fast enough. We don't need any optimization. Starting with SAE, we have this cryptographic computation at the beginning. We might think about improving it. But we definitely need something with .1x. This EAP exchange can take too much time if you want to do it but on every roam. Here, an example with EAP TLS. And EAP TLS is one of the most efficient ways to do the EAP exchange. It was already 300 milliseconds. This client does PEEP. And we are needing an additional round trip for the radio server to tell the client, hey, let's do EAP TLS. And the client says, oh, no, I can't do that. Let, let us do PEEP. Then we build our tunnel and have an inner method that is typically dependent on a communication from the radio server to an external server, the Active Directory. And that took 500 milliseconds in this capture. Well, fast BSS transition will help us. First assumption, of course, we want to have our encrypted connection. We want to build our PTKs. We do this typically with a four-way handshake. For the four-way handshake, we need a PMK on every AP. But when our client connects to the first AP, does the, forward, does the EAP exchange, the MSK gets delivered to the first AP, and we do our four-way handshake. But when we roam, how do we get our PMK? And solving this problem is the main magic of fast BSS transition, but not the only. If we handle our keys differently, we have a different key hierarchy. We can't use a traditional key hierarchy with our MSK that gets into our PMK and we calculate our PTK. It's more complex. And the easiest way to look at this new key hierarchy is from a controller-based perspective. Our client connects and does the EAP exchange. The radio server delivers the MSK to the controller. And the controller generates the first level of keys. We have three levels of keys. And that is a PMK R0. Because the controller is the owner of this key, he becomes the R0 key holder. Now our client is connected to the left AP. This AP also needs a PMK, which is a PMK R1, which is a second gen level of keys. And the controller generates a key, sends it to the AP, and the AP becomes a R1 key holder for this AP and can generate the PDK. Later, this process is repeated for the second AP, third AP, fourth AP, and so forth, and so on. 
Our client has the same key hierarchy, just as the key holders have different names. It's an S0 key holder, it's a S1 key holder. The roles are not always that easy. Sometimes the controller is more centralized and is both the key holder for R0 and R1 and distributes the PTKs. Or we don't have a controller at all. Then our first AP that our client connects to is typically the key holder for the PMKR0 and generates a PMKR1 for itself and generates all the PMKR1s for the second, third, fourth AP that our client roams to. How does our client know that, that we can use this? We have a new element, the mobility domain element, and the main information is a mobility domain identifier. It's just a two-byte value, and all our devices, our APs that want to provide this cooperative feature needs to have the same mobility domain ID. Then we have two modes, over the air, which is typically used, where the whole roaming process is done with frames to the target AP, and we have the optional over the DS that is only allowed to be used if support is mentioned in our information element. And there we start the roaming on the previous AP and continue on the target AP. We have two protocols, the FT protocol for the actual roaming and then reservation protocol that to my knowledge is implemented nowhere. And of course, we have new AKMs. We don't use the traditional AKMs. Uh, I only take care about dot, the dot one, use, dot one X use case here. We are not using AKM one or five. We are having the new AKM, or new, well, 2008, AKM three. And this AKM gets announced in our RSN element, for example, with only announcing the FT AKM, then every device needs to be compatible with it. And this notebook couldn't connect anymore because it's the last device from Apple with an Intel chipset and that doesn't have fast transition. More likely is we announce both an FT AKM and a non FT AKM. This is AKM5 for WPA3 Enterprise. And then there were the clients that didn't even understand this. And we had a way to announce a non-FT AKM, but still have our mobility domain. That was the adaptive thing from Apple and Cisco. I hope we don't need it anymore. And for that, I have a frame-by-frame -frame example how our client connects to the left AP, does the so-called initial mobility domain Co uh, con connection. With this initial mobility domain connection, well, we not only connect to the network, we also prepare everything what we need on the next fast transition. The beacon show, it's enabled. I have my mobility domain. I announce my uh, AKMs, including the one with FT, and our client does an authentication. This is an open system authentication on the initial connection. So nothing special there. After that, we have our association request. And there, our client uses the correct FT AKM and includes the, includes the mobility domain. And the AP answers with the association response and includes a new element, the fast BSS transition element. And that is where most of the magic happens. In this fast BSS transition element, the AP tells our client who is the key holder for the PMKR1 and who is the key holder for the PMKR0. How did our AP choose these hex numbers? It's defined as a standard. The R1 key holder ID is the MAC address of this AP. And the R0 key holder ID is a NAS identifier. And when I first looked at these captures, I thought, how is this hex stump my NAS identifier? Well, but after having some good coffee, I saw, oh yes, the NAS identifier is ASCII, 
but the key identifier is hex. We just have to translate it. And then we see that this hex is really the NAS identifier. After that, we do our EAP exchange. Nothing special here. The radio server doesn't need to know that we are using fast transition. It's again EAP TLS. And if you wonder why we don't see any certificates here, it's TLS 103. But after the exchange, our client has an MSK and Scott can start building the key hierarchy. The MSK is also delivered to our, to our initial authenticator, the first AP, and we can calculate the PMKR0. Every old PMKR0 has to be deleted. It's not allowed to have multiple cached keys with FastBSS transition. The calculation of the PMKs, we take the MSK, this time we use a second bunch of 256 bits and run it to a hash algorithm for some information like mobility domain ID and level one information from the key hierarchy for our S0 key holder and R1 key holder and get the PMK R0. We take that, run it again through a hash algorithm and get the PMK R1. All these hash algorithms are SHA-256 if we are using AKM3. In the future, it might be SHA-384 with the AKM22. Was it 22? I think yes. And then we have our FT four-way handshake, which is quite similar to the normal four-way handshake. We generate our PTK, again a hash algorithm, SHA-256, and we include more data in the WPA key data on our message to, and our session is set up, our connection is there. This took 320 milliseconds, and this capture, absolutely okay for the initial connection, but too long if you want to do it on every row. So, our row. Our client goes to the target AP and sends an authentication frame. It talks directly to the target AP, so it's over the air. This authentication frame is not an open authentication, it's a fast BSS transition authentication frame that includes much more information than the open authentication. We have our mobility domain, we have our RSN element, including the right AKM and the cipher suit. And the standard now wants our, desk, our target AP to check these values, and if they don't match, the connection has to be rejected. What I th thought is very interesting, the client is not allowed to change cipher suites while doing the fast BSS transition. He is not allowed to do that. Well, our target AP now needs the PMKR1. For that, the client includes the information who is the R0 key holder with its ID. The target AP reaches out to the initial authenticator and gets the PMKR1. The standard says, dear vendor, do this as you want, but make sure that it's done through a secure channel that is at least as secure as the connection we want to build. That's the whole requirement. Then we have the authentication response from our AP. Oh, no, not yet. If our target AP has already a cached PMKR1, we can't directly use it because the target AP has no knowledge if the client has done a new EAP exchange since the last connection. But for that, we have our PMKID, which holds a PMKR0 name, which is basically an ID, and can calculate the PMKR1 name compared to the cached PMKR1, and if it matches, it can be used. If it doesn't match, the target AP has to request a new PMKR1 from the initial authenticator. Now, the definition was not to remove the EAP exchange. It was about minimizing the time. And we minimize the time, we lose the connection to the DS further by removing the four-way handshake. Well, we don't really remove it. 
but we embed the functionality of the four-way handshake in our authentication and reassociation frames. And for that, our client already sends the supplicant nonce in the first authentication frame. Our AP answers with an authentication again and includes the authenticator nonce. So after these two authentication frames, the PTK can already be generated. And the AP includes that he is our one key holder for this connection with his, its ID, which is again the MAC address of this AP. After that, we have our reassociation request. And we have all the information that we expect from a reassociation, our uh, supported rates, to which SSID do we want to connect, and we also include a message integrity code. On the final frame, the reassociation response, our AP includes all the information that are still needed for our robust security network association, like what is our GTK for our multicast broadcast traffic, and because it's WPA3, what is our integrity GTK? And this, or after these four frames, our client enters state four with a target AP and has to go back to state one, unauthenticated, unassociated with the previous AP. And this whole process took 53 milliseconds. Enough even for our voice clients. The roam back was even only 30 milliseconds. Of course, it's always more or less depending on the environment. Well, and this was a fast roam, or even two fast roams, in less than 20 minutes. Okay, it was even less. Before finishing, my call to action, enable fast BSS transition now. Optionally, think about the disclaimer from the beginning and always know your clients. And if you say, no, that's still too slow, I want it even faster, then we know Wi-Fi 8 can be the solution, or even better, wait for Wi-Fi 10, which Peter presented two years ago, because with Wi-Fi 10, the client can finish the roam before he even decides to roam. And then it can't get any faster. Thank you. <laughs>